Hey everyone, my name is Chris Anderson and I'm in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This park receives over 80 inches of rain a year, has over a mile of elevation change, giving it home for over 21,000 species. So where do all these living things get their energy? Let's find out today on Outsider Classroom. <laughs> Great Smoky Mountains are one of the largest and best preserved forests in all of North America. In fact, the Great Smokies is the most biodiverse park in the entire national park system. All living things in this park, as well as pretty much all living things on the surface of the Earth, get their energy either directly or indirectly from our great nuclear fusion reactor in the sky, the sun. Every hour of every day, 430 quin Trillion joules of solar energy hits the surface of the Earth. That's the number 430 with 16 zeros behind it. The sun powers everything from dog woods to woodchucks. Heck, even you and me. Living things need energy to grow, reproduce, and survive. And we can classify living things by how they get their energy. Let's start with producers living things that can capture the sun's energy. They do this through a process called photosynthesis in which they absorb sunlight, combine it with carbon dioxide and water to create sugar. Essentially, they lock away the sun's energy in the chemical bonds of a sugar molecule. Some important producers in the Great Smokies include the rhododendron, eastern hemlocks, uh, tulip poplars, red oaks, mosses, pretty much anything that's green and a plant. Then there are consumers, living things that eat other living things. Consumers can't photosynthesize, so they have to eat a producer who does it for them. Or they eat something that ate a producer. Or they eat something that eats something that eats a producer. Some important consumers in the Great Smokies include the red fox, the barred owl, the gray squirrel, and of course the iconic black bear. Last, but certainly not least, are decomposers living things that break down dead organisms or waste material for energy. These are things like fungi and bacteria, and they're really important because they help nutrients get cycled back into the soil as they do their morbid thing. Without decomposers, dead material and poop would just pile up. It would get really gross really quickly, but it would also lock out things like carbon and nitrogen from being recycled back through the ecosystem. But it's not just important that we know how living things get energy. It's important to know how that energy is transferred between living things. And we can show how energy flows in an ecosystem through something called a food web. We can see how living things interact and how they influence each other. To teach us more about food webs is my friend and conservation biologist, Brooke Mitchell Norman. My name is Brooke Mitchell Norman, and I am a conservation biologist and a podcast host. A food web is the collection of food chains that happen to be in a single ecosystem. A food web can tell us how exactly energy moves from the lowest levels of a food chain all the way up through the top and back around. And the food web can give us an exact structure of how that energy moves specifically from one trophic level to the other and back around in a beautiful circular system. Yeah, so our energy starts with our primary producers, which you see all around me right now. So what they do is they take abiotic energy, so they usually energy from the sun, and they turn it into organic matter. And then every trophic level above that consumes the one below it. These are normally consumed by our first level, or our primary consumers. Those are your herbivores, your things that eat normally green things, or the first level of those primary producers. Then above that are our secondary consumers. Normally these you would, consume, you would think of as your 
meso predators or your middle level predators. So those are the ones that normally hunt on maybe the, the first, the primary consumers. So that, that again, those are your herbivores. Think of like a coyote hunting a, a bunny rabbit, as you can think of in this ecosystem here. And then above that are our apex predators or our tertiary consumers. Those are the top of the ecosystem. Those are the top of the food chain, the food web, and they control pretty much everything down below them. So let's say that we take out one of the middle layers, for example. So let's say, like for example, coyotes were removed from this ecosystem. Then maybe the things that directly coyotes eat would then flourish and their numbers would just go out the wazoo. For example, we'll go back to our rabbits. So then let's say that maybe there is a particular plant that they really love and there's nothing controlling rabbits anymore. So then they might eat that one plant to close to extinction. And what if that one plant was vitally important for a different species? Now that species is gonna be extinct because its food source is no longer there. Or maybe it eats seedlings that then this particular tree grows on that that one bird needs to nest. So now they no longer have anywhere to raise their babies. So you can have catastrophic consequences down low and then up high let's say that wolves maybe they would eat a lot of coyotes or attack a lot of coyotes then that is a main food prey that then they no longer have and their numbers will start to decline as well so everything is absolutely connected so you'll have some areas where things are flourishing because nothing's controlling their numbers and the exact opposite where now they don't have a food source anymore like our apex predators might not have a food source plants might be overeaten by herbivores there's nothing controlling their numbers and then all of the cascading effects after that that again are very rarely a good thing consumers eat producers or other consumers for energy but they have a small problem that transfer isn't super efficient. Only around 10% of the energy at any given trophic level is available for the trophic level above it. Most of the rest of that energy is lost as heat. Say for example, the producers of an ecosystem capture 10,000 joules of solar energy. That means only around 1,000 joules would be available for the primary consumers to live on. It also means there'd only be around 100 joules for secondary consumers and only 10 joules for tertiary consumers. The effect of all this is that biomass gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you move up a food web. There's just not enough energy that makes it to the top levels of a food web to support a large population of tertiary consumers. You're always going to have more trees and bushes and grasses than you will predators like, say, a gray wolf or a barred owl. One of the best parts of visiting the Great Smoky Mountains is that you're pretty likely to see a black bear. It's an awesome experience to see these animals in the wild, but it's good to know what you should do if you see a bear on the trail. If you do see a bear, first give them plenty of space, at least 50 yards. That's about the distance of two school buses back to back. And bears don't like surprises, so if you see a bear up ahead, make sure it knows that you're around. Make some noise, maybe give it a friendly little shout like, Hey buddy, or hey guy, or you're not my buddy guy. Okay, maybe not that last one. If a bear does charge at you, don't panic. Stand your ground. Make yourself look as big as possible. Wave your arms in the air, or some, pick up some sticks, or your trekking poles, maybe stand on a rock or a stump. But whatever you do, don't run. But these are just tips for staying safe. Most bears aren't aggressive and attacks are very, very rare. And part of the fun of going out into the wilderness is seeing these animals in their homes. But this is their home and you are their guest, so act accordingly. Be aware of your surroundings, stay safe, and have fun. Well, 
that's our show. Thanks for watching. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some solar radiance meters that need to be calibrated. We'll see you next time on Outside a Classroom. Want to learn more about our national parks? Then hit that subscribe button, friend. Stay up to date and catch bonus features by following us on Instagram, at Outsider.